I would now like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathered, gathering today, in whichever part of Australia you are located. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and elders from other com communities who may be with us. As mentioned previously, my name is Leela Lewis and I'm a director at Michael Page. I've been on the Australian board since 2016 and I'm also the chair of our Women at Page programme. This is the second year that Michael Page has partnered with the Vesky STEM Side by Side programme as we believe that the programme aligns with our value of changing lives and saw the opportunity to bring this value to life through this partnership. For those of you who don't know, Michael Page is a leading white collar recruitment agency and employ over 7,000 staff with 140 offices, uh, offices in 36 countries. The Vesky Inspiring Women STEM Side-by-Side -side program is a dynamic professional development program that supports women wanting to progress or extend into leadership positions within STEM industries. So science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Delivered for the third time in 2020, the program is exclusively for a cohort of competitively selected mid-career emerging leaders, led by Vesky with the support of the British Consulate General Melbourne. The program in 2020 is generously funded by Victorian universities and supporting businesses and corporations. Now, today's Board Pathway and Insights webinar aims to provide examples of pathways to securing your first board role or to provide you with the insights on how to better understand strategies to grow your board portfolio. We want this session to be as useful to you as possible and to tailor the content based on what you are looking to understand further. So in this instance, I urge you to please use the Q&A to address any questions. Today, I'm delighted to welcome experienced chairman, trusted advisor and strategic thinker, Genevieve Overall to moderate our panel. Genevieve's career spans leading executive and non-executive roles in financial and professional services, government, industry peak bodies, health sector, non-for-profits and the arts. In the 2020 Queen's Birthday Honours, Genevieve was made a member of the Order of Australia in recognition of her service to the community through roles in a range of organisations. Today's panel, Stacey Ong, Andrew Popolo and Leonie Walsh, whose bios you've all had access to via our registration page, have kindly agreed to share their board pathways and insights, touching on what pathways they took to securing their first appointment, why joining a board can be a good career move, and what roles and duties a board directors really have. Genevieve, over to you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Leela, uh, and welcome to our panelists. Uh, for my part, taking on a board role was something that um, sparked my interest very early in my career. Uh, I was a, a young lawyer. I was encouraged by my partners to look to community service, to volunteer my services uh, in magistrates courts as amicus curiae. Um, from there, I also volunteered through community organisations, legal services, uh, a group that assisted uh, women who required uh, assistance through uh, various exigencies. That led me to identifying that there was much that could be achieved through both professional and community service organisations as a young lawyer. I then was encouraged to step up join the professional organisations of the Law Institute and Law Council. That led me uh, to recognise that building a career could be part of a board portfolio. So as I was uh, developing my legal career, I had a second track, if you like, a dual track, and that was I identified the boards and committees that I could serve on, which would build my knowledge, experience and profile along my journey to becoming a partner in a national law firm. From joining the professional membership bodies, that led me to thinking about the industry specialisations of my legal career that could offer me opportunities to serve on a wider range of boards with a wider range of participants, 
members, shareholders, stakeholders, and fellow board directors. That led me to industry bodies like the Urban Development Institute of Australia, the Property Council of Australia, Victoria Division, on both of which I served as a non-executive director. So from industry sector boards, where I was working and uh, learning and sharing um, knowledge and experience with people in the same sector, I thought, well, I can also follow one of my passions and that is for the arts. And so I volunteered with the, what was known as the Australian Business Arts Foundation, also with CEDA and other organisations where I could join committees and boards pursuing interests uh, beyond my professional day-to-day -day work as a lawyer and in the property industry. So those boards iteratively uh, put me in a position where I was then approached to serve on a government board where I chaired what was the Building Advisory Council for the Victorian government and that in itself led to other opportunities. At the, at the present time, having, shall we say, moved through more than three decades in a variety of board roles, public and private sector, I'm now pursuing a full-time non-executive career. And I look forward to sharing some insights with you today. I will now ask uh, that Stacey share her views and experience. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you, Genevieve, and you um, are a very hard act to follow. I'm probably the most junior of non-executive directors on the panel today. So I will be providing a um, just slightly different view on how my, my journey evolved onto the boards that I currently serve on. Um, so the only thing that's similar, similar about mine and Genevieve's um, journeys is that I was also a young manager, a young management consultant within PricewaterhouseCoopers. And I have a very strong passion for gender equality and um, ending violence against women. And so I um, applied for a non-executive director role with the Domestic Violence Resource Centre Victoria. And so it was just um, out of the blue, I applied um, and went through the recruitment process and was successful in being appointed to that board. And I'm still on that board today. That was five years ago um, that I applied to be on it. Um, and I'm now currently also on the board of Domestic Violence Victoria, which is the peak body for uh, the Specialist Family Violence Services in Victoria, and also sit on the Risk and Audit Subcommittee for Our Watch, which is the organisation for the prevention of violence against women. Um, so my board career is very much driven by my personal passions, which is a not-for-profit, but it also aligns with my professional work. And so I have done um, a range of professional work in management consulting uh, in domestic violence, family violence, violence against women. Our watch was uh, previously one of my clients and you know I maintained that relationship for a number of years and that's why um, I'm now on the risk and audit subcommittee. I think it definitely helps if you understand the work of the organization that you want to um, be on the board of. And I think if I were to sum up my journey so far, um, it's really been one of the most rewarding professional things that, I, that I've done in my career, um, sitting around a board table with very diverse points of view uh, to nut out strategic uh, stewardship issues with uh, my fellow board members has been highly, highly rewarding. Um, the other couple of things that I will also mention is that I was part of the Victorian government's Women Board Leadership Program last year, which is wonderful. Um, and then also, as a board, we participate on the observership program, which I will talk about in more detail. It's um, a program that supports younger board members into uh, boards. And I'll hand over to Andrew now. Thank you, Stacey. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So my, my part's been a little bit different to the other panelists as well. So I uh, had a career 25 years, <coughs> excuse me, 25 years in financial services. Uh, started off with a large company companies such as MasterCard and Citibank, and then had the good fortune of being involved with PayPal in the very early days, and launched PayPal here in Australia in 2004, which was quite successful, as, as we would all know, and then moved on and launched PayPal in Japan in 2009. 
with the uh, earthquake and the Fukushima meltdown, came back and really pursued a uh, career more in startups. So it was involved with a startup called Lupe, which is Boston based startup, which ended up exiting to Samsung in 2015. So <clears throat> my foray into boards has come relatively late. Very singular focus in my career. And it wasn't until uh, basically in semi-retirement that I decided to look for new avenues to where I could actually give something back and find new interests. And I wasn't actually actively looking for board positions, but I was approached by a couple of companies and took on those roles and really struggled with the uh, want and desire to still be hands-on, but take on the board stewardship role. And it's quite a diff different wild role and takes a while to get used to. So I've had a mixture of uh, private company board positions and public listed companies as well. Uh, very different animals, a very different beast, and you have to take a different approach. But it's been a great uh, ride with board positions and learnt a lot and hopefully contributed to the companies that I've been involved with. So again, uh, it's not something that I've pursued directly, but it's been a great um, tail end to my career in financial services, and I look forward to continuing it further. And with that, I'll pass on to Leone. Leone, you're on mute. Thanks again, Andrew. Um, my pathway um, onto board roles started about 30 years ago, and, and I have to say it's not a pathway that I would uh, encourage uh, with regards to your first board role, but my involvement came um, through a personal experience with leukemia. I crossed paths with a father of a co-patient who saw a gap in Australia with regards to leukemia pa patients needing a transplant, but not having a match within their family. I was personally fortunate to have a sister that was my bone, my match for a bone marrow transplant and reached out to him to offer my help when I'd recovered from the transplant. So this led to my first board position with an organization called the Bone Marrow Donor Institute. And that also involved a range of committee roles such as an ethics review committee and also helping to set up a leukemia family support group which in my late twenties um, led to a whole diverse range of skills and experience that I've been able to leverage throughout my career. My next board position is a little bit more traditional and it's a pathway which I would encourage. And that was uh, around a decade later after I'd returned from overseas work. I became a member of an industry association, a volunteer member, and was soon asked to be on the executive committee and then a few years later, it's fair to say I was um, nudged and encouraged to end up chairing this um, industry uh, association. And again, it was uh, an experience that connected me with a, a very diverse range of people from government, industry and academia, both locally and internationally. And also that particular role uh, then went on to be part of a credential um, for another significant job that I um, had progressed to uh, further in my career. I also, at that time of coming back to Australia, rejoined the board of the Bone Marrow Donor Institute, which had been named, renamed Fight Cancer Foundation at that time. And I, I still sit on the Fight Can Cancer Foundation as the vice chair having stepped down um, just a, a month or so ago uh, from being chair of that board for six years. The merging of um, professional and personal interest board roles happened probably in another decade later as I moved from full-time roles into consulting and contract roles. And the role of lead scientist for the Victorian government seemed to attract board positions. Uh, and when I completed this role, I had a decision to go back to full-time work, consulting, or focus more on our boards. I now have a portfolio of board roles across education, renewable energy, clean technologies, and cancer support, including a recent appointment to the board of Esky. It's fair to say, uh, like Andrew, I didn't plan to have a board career. It was more a natural evolution or progression of the type of work that I was doing uh, as my career evolved. 
what I enjoy most about the type of work is being able to use my professional and interpersonal skills and knowledge to help in areas that are important um, to me and, and like Stacey that I'm passionate about. Some of the key skills that um, I use in those roles are um, strategic management, governance, finance and relationship management. Uh, a common theme uh, is that I've in been encouraged to take on different roles rather than actively pursuing them. Um, and I have a mix of advisory board roles and board roles and enjoy the advisory board roles as they tend to be more technical than procedural. Uh, and lastly, I do manage my portfolio and transition on and off different boards when I think the timing is right and someone else is better placed to contribute. So thank you and I'll hand back to Genevieve. Thank you very much, Leonie. Uh, as Leela mentioned, we're going to conduct a couple of polls where we're seeking your input from your personal experience. So the first poll, please have a look at it. Please answer as you see fit. The answers are completely anonymous, but it will give us an idea of the composition of our audience today. And uh, we have received a few questions already through our Q&A, which I'll go to in just a moment uh, and uh, share those with members of the panel. Already, it seems that uh, a question that's going to be a fairly popular one, and I'll ask my fellow colleagues to uh, opine on it, and that is, how do we get to step one? How do we find our first board? So let me just see how we've... Poll results, have a look here. Don't currently have a board role, almost half, and Others are looking to secure a role or increase their current portfolio. So I think that question is going to be useful to a lot of people. So who would like to comment on how does one get our first board role? Um, why, don't, why don't I jump in? Um, the, the thing that I was, <coughs> excuse me, the thing I was terrible at was networking. I've always been very bad at that. So I would encourage anyone looking for a board position to really start there. Put yourself out there, contact people that you know that are on boards uh, and let it be known that you're interested and focus on the area that you've got the expertise in. Um, other areas that I would recommend, uh, LinkedIn has, um, I think in a profile, you can select that if you're open to board positions, they will put board positions forward to you. And I know that if you if you're able to join the AICD, they have um, kind of like speed dating for board positions where companies that are looking for board roles will meet in an evening session. and You've got two or three minutes to pitch why you'd be good on their board or why you're interested on in being on their board. They typically tend to be charities uh, or the like. But there there's some practical examples, but I would think the most effective, I mean, they all can be effective and I have been approached through LinkedIn for a board position, um, which uh, ended up, uh, and which I'm, I'm still on that board. Uh, the AICD is a very good avenue. We, we did recruit the very first PayPal Australia chair, chairwoman, uh, Bonnie Booserman through the AICD. Uh, so that was a very effective tool. <clears throat> but again, um, spend the time, make the time to contact people that you think can be key influences in getting onto boards. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, let's go to another question, and that is, what are some of the common challenges you find being on a board? Now, that's a very wide ranging question. Um, who would like to have a a go at providing some insights. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to um, have a go at that one. You know, one of the, the challenges I find is uh, to, to work out whether the board um, is focused more on procedural activities or strategic activities of the organization. And, you know, sometimes boards can be formed because it's a requir regulatory requirement or it's a, a requirement um, from the particular organization and you know it, it's can be very frustrating when you come on a board to provide strategic input and 
really help them achieve results and, and you find that most of the board activities are for information or for noting or and you're not really helping make decisions that um, progress the organization. So it's, it's working out what boards um, are the right fit for you and, and what your intent is for joining that board. Thank you, Leonie. Can I also add to that, Genevieve? I think um, if I were to say something that has been common and like, and I've only served on a number of boards, a couple of boards so far, um, but it is really the quality of the information because you're only, the board meeting is really structured around the information that you get and um, the decisions that you're there to make. But the quality of the information is something that I'm imagining is a common challenge across all of across all boards because that really frames um, the quality of discussion around the table and the decisions that you're there to make. So I think as board directors, one of the things that we have to be um, cognizant and mindful of is asking for the right information if it isn't there, about having really rigorous um, discussions uh, with management about the papers that are put before you to really having sufficient information and to satisfy yourself as a board director about the decision that you're going to make um, collectively. So I would say um, that making sure that we have the right information, that the information is framed appropriately, that it gives us enough time to consider all of those things are probably, um, I think, challenges that are common across all boards. Yeah, Thank you very I, much, Stacey. Can I, if I could add, I think one of the one of the really significant challenges I've come across is that you always have to remember what role you play on the board. And there, you are there to protect shareholder interests. And sometimes that conflicts a lot with management, conflicts with the CEO, conflicts with your own personal position at times. So to me, that's the biggest challenge. You always have to remember that you are there to re represent all shareholder interests, not just the larger shareholders, which could be the founder on the board or could be an institution, but you are there to represent all shareholders. And if you take that as your North Star, I think, you know, I think that'll serve you well. Very good points from everyone. Thank you very much indeed. We have lots of questions, so let's press on. Is there a need for a formal qualification before joining a board? For example, the AICD that Andrew has mentioned. Uh, would anyone like to comment from their experience? Yeah, I certainly didn't have any formal, formal qualifications um, on the first few boards that, that I joined. It was more the personal interest and and, and some of the more uh, broader professional skills that, that helped from a contribution. You know, I have to say, as I progressed onto boards and as the environment got um, more uh, focused on you know the liability issues around boards and the responsibilities and roles of board members i have certainly completed courses and do top up courses on a regular basis to make sure i keep up to date with you know what are the requirements and responsibilities and accountability of, of a board member thank you leone i think that's a very good point to bear in mind and that is being a director is in fact a professional commitment and so to have a foundation of governance training, financial literacy, experience uh, across a number of different sectors will serve you very well. And on an ongoing basis, we all undertake uh, formal and informal uh, training programs to maintain currency, currency of knowledge of uh, the corporation's law and a whole range of other laws and regulations relevant to the responsibilities and duties of boards. So it really is something that one does, takes very seriously and devotes that time to as a threshold or entry point. Uh, the AICD has been mentioned a couple of times and they do run an excellent uh, company directors course, which uh, I would certainly recommend uh, to anyone uh, looking to pursue a, a board career. Now, another question is, um, what is the expectation of the time commitment involved in a board if you are already in full-time employment? I think we've all had that experience. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> uh, I think if you're on a publicly listed company, it's going to be quite 
onerous. You're going to spend a lot of time in that board position. If if it's on a privately held entity or a wholly owned subsidiary, it will be less. But uh, it's never as little as people think. It's um, it's it's at least I would say on average for my positions probably averages out about five hours a week for each board position, um, depending on the issues at, at the time. But it's. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not just turn up and read the board papers and go home. Yeah, yeah. I think it also, um, Andrew provides, you know, I think we, we provide really different perspectives, which is really useful because Andrew's on, you know, big corporate type boards, whereas I'm on a not-for-profit boards and sometimes that can be a little bit more hands-on in the doing. Um, so, and so I would think that it depends on, the time commitment depends on the kind of issues that the board is facing, the kind of board that you're on, um, and also your position on the board. I spent um, a year as acting chair and that was an enormous amount of work. And I hadn't, even though I'd been on the board for three years prior, I hadn't appreciated how much work the chair actually does. Um, and then if I can just frame a couple of other things that we had, um, we did a restructure one year and the board was very hands-on in that restructure. And so like subcommittee meetings and the time requ requirement for subcommittee meetings was very onerous so um i can just only second andrew and say it's much more than you would think but that said it's terribly rewarding work if you're in a board that you um care deeply about thank there you are, Steve. Uh, there yeah, are boards that um meet a couple of times a year or once a quarter um the fight cancer foundation for example meets out of hours a lot of the activities are out of hours i was able to um, maintain that role throughout my whole professional career uh, without compromising my my professional role or the board role so you know agree with Stacey and Andrew there are all sorts of different types of board roles out there and it's finding the one that will fit you know your circumstances at the time and indeed um, the point that sits behind some of the decisions we make is the preparedness of our employer of the day to support us being on a board. So I yeah. think that makes an enormous difference. If the employer regards your contribution to the, the external board as valuable to your contribution and accretive to your employer, uh, that will support you when, shall we say, there are further demands on your time. Now, lots yeah. and lots more questions. Um, and I'll just synthesize this one. Are there any hints we can offer to distinguish between good boards and dysfunctional boards mm. and I think we've some of us have had those experiences would anyone care to share a secret or two about what are the warning signs what flags might we be looking for I would suggest that as part of your due diligence that you um, request to have a coffee with um, a couple of existing board members because that will always give you um, a different perspective on what the current board is like and what the current board culture is like. So um, my suggestion is informal coffees and asking around your networks as well about what, what you've heard about that board. Very good advice indeed. Could I now ask us to go to poll number two and have a look and please let us know what answer you would give. And I should also say this is not a right and wrong question. So in that there are some people who would uh, have a view as to on their particular board which skills will be most important in executing your duties as a director of that board. And on other boards, you might find a different mix of skills might be more important. So this, there's no sort of really right or wrong here, but uh, there's some hints there for you to think about. So uh, I'll just give you a few seconds there to consider and give us some feedback there. Which we'll Can find I also in. offer a comment about this one, Genevieve, if that's yes, okay? Um, something I forgot to mention in my introduction is that I've also recruited Victorian government boards. So just that um, reminded me when you put up a list of different um, skills and it goes to one of the earlier questions about, you know, what qualifications are um, useful. When putting together um, these boards, we were not necessarily looking for particular, like governance is incredibly important, 
but um, it is the mix of skills that um, we were looking for. And so it was very much about putting together the right cake or the right um, mix of people around that board table to get the magic of a really good, strong, effective board. Um, so I think looking at that, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't say that one skill is more important than the other. And the other um, point to make is we're very cognizant when we were putting together the board that um, if there were skill gaps that we would support certain individuals to meet them. So we would provide induction and training if we needed additional governance support um, to that um, board. So if you do have a skill gap, you can always suggest that you'll undertake specific training, that you'll be buddied with somebody else. Like there are lots of different avenues for um, meeting particular skill gaps. Um, and networking is incredibly important as well because that was one of the avenues that we found uh, particular recruits. Thank you, Stacey. Now, just having a look at the poll results, you can see that there's strong interest uh, across uh, most, most of those suggestions. And those suggestions, of course, uh, were not accidental. Uh, strategic thinking is by far and away uh, the winner, uh, which is an interesting, an interesting uh, must have. Uh, according to uh, almost everyone in our audience, and I don't think any of us would disagree with that. Uh, thank you for participating in that, that poll. Uh, could I just take us to another question? And uh, that is, just a moment, sorry, that's better. Um, what do you do when you're the only female on a board? Do you know, I've been on boards where there's only one male as well. So I suppose it cuts both ways. If one is in an undiverse board, how do we tackle it, panelists? Well, I'm probably the least qualified to answer that, I guess. <laughs> um, but I think I will just uh, say if I can, I think certainly in Australia, there's been a greater push to get greater female representation on boards. I've recently when i say recently about 12 months 18 months ago met with a company that only does board appointments and they they told me that 70 percent of their briefs were mandatory must be female board member 70 percent and the rest had a preference but not mandated so i think that's a very positive sign actually but to answer your question specifically i'm not sure i'll have to leave that to one of the others and I, I sit on a, a number of different boards and advisory boards as the only female. And, you know, I, I guess there's two aspects to it. While I'm participating in that role, I contribute based on my knowledge and experience and connections as, as I would mixing in any diverse group. Um, but the other side of it is when I'm typically asked for names or connections, most of the ones that I come up with and refer are females or, um, you know, come from a broader diverse group than, than what the board consists of. So, you know, there is an opportunity for you as the only board member to, in, to keep promoting and encouraging that board as they're looking for new members or even expanding the board that they improve that, the diversity aspects from a good business perspective and, and a good you know, a diversity perspective as well. Thank you very much. I might move to another question here. Uh, being on a board has almost become an assumed career step for many people, but not everyone is suited to board roles and it's not always the best career step. What should people think about when deciding whether or not a board role is what they should be following? I think it probably goes to some of the things that we've discussed already. So I think you've got to consider the time commitment and whether you're willing to make that time commitment. Um, there are, if you're going for a unpaid board role, it becomes very clear. Do you want to spend X amount of time working on this particular issue, supporting this particular organisation? And if the answer is no, then, you know, then it's no. But I think, um, I, I think it's a really, um, nuanced question and it's a really good question to consider um, and not just assume that a board role is for everyone. It does take a lot of time and I do think you have to have a lot of commitment to um, 
the purpose of the organization that you're working with. Thank I think you there's very also much. a work style aspect as well. And, you know, I'd spent majority of my career in organizations and thoroughly enjoyed that collegiate atmosphere, working as part of a team, having regular colleagues that you could socialize with and become friends with that, or, you know, part of your professional family members. As you progress into boards, you know, you spend smaller amounts of time spread across a range of different organizations. And you know, you don't, I don't feel that same sense of connectedness, if you like, to an organization or an outcome or a team uh, working across boards as I did in the corporate sector. Very good point. Very different style of working uh, mm -hmm. and networking. Uh, another question from our audience. What is the most effective strategy for transitioning from not-for-profit boards to startups or corporate boards? Uh, I'm not sure about transitioning, but certainly startups. Um, I would go to organisations like Stone and Chalk, Fishburners Cafe, those those sorts of companies. There's a couple more out there, in, certainly in Sydney, and just attend their conferences and their webinars and get to meet people there, get to get a feel for the companies that are working in those environments, and and really goes to the heart of what everyone else has been saying. You, you have to have a passion for the board that you're working on. So it's no point joining a startup in financial services if you have no interest in financial services. Find, find the companies that are doing things that you want to be part of and you feel passionate about and you think you would like to contribute towards and to hound them down. I mean, that's the best thing to do. Just, you know, go to those meetings, talk to people, uh, eventually it'll pay dividends. It's, it's, uh, it's, you know, you probably go to 20 meetings and you'll pick up one or two hot prospects to, to be able to do something with. So, um, it's a good question. Um, I don't know if the other panelists might have other insights. Anyone else like to comment? Yeah, I think, um, you know, my experience in, in picking up more, uh, corporate sector boards is come through volunteer roles on industry associations. And so, you know, there's always a gap in people wanting or being prepared to work on executive teams or subcommittees. And, and that's a good way to get introduced, to demonstrate your skills, demonstrate, you know, your willingness and ability to contribute. And I, I think, you know, you'll find that fairly quickly that people um, appreciate that. And, you know, you, then you can progress through that organization. Um, and, and once I think it's clear from all of our backgrounds that once you get on that pathway, the other roles and opportunities tend to find you. Thank you, Leonie. Uh, another question, we'll, we'll try and move through a couple more. Uh, there is a trend to advocate for age diversity in boards. Do you think younger people, not looking at anyone in particular, Stacey, uh, will be taken seriously in boards. Sometimes younger people are intimidated by the, the incumbent members of a board. What is your point of view about younger members on boards? Come on, Stacey, catch that ball. Thank you. Um, I, uh, how to answer that? So I serve uh, on a number of boards and subcommittees where I am the youngest uh, member. So. But then at the same time, I'm a management consultant and we're trained to be bolshy and we're trained to uh, express our views to C-suites and boards all of the time. So I think some of my training has just been in not being afraid to voice my opinion in a very respectful way. And if I don't know, um, if I'm not entirely sure about the answer or, you know, I feel like everyone else has much more experience, I'll frame it in, would it be worthwhile to consider X, Y, Z, for example? Um, and the only other thing I would say is don't underestimate the incredible skills and value that you have to bring um, to the board. I think being really clear on what your value proposition to that board is before you arrive is also really helpful. So I'm a strategy consultant by trade. I have strong financial management um, 
uh, training and background. So I think it's being clear on what your skills and experience are and the value that you can provide. And then if they chose you, if they recruited you, then, you know, uh, I think you've got to trust in their decision making as well and feel confident in your own capacity to be able to add value. And that that is the role that you've been recruited for is to ask the tricky questions and have um, rigorous debate. Uh, very good answer, Stacey. Remembering that when you are recruited to a board, you have been chosen. There is support in the room for you, your views, and um, there's a lot of value in adopting the networking uh, approach that everyone has mentioned and getting to know your fellow board members. So it's much easier, of course, to be in a room with eight or nine people whom you know whom, with whom you've had a coffee, you know their backgrounds, they know yours, that builds uh, a natural reservoir of confidence and comfort. If you don't put that time in and you're in a room of strangers and uh, you um, have not invested in those relationships, I think it would be a lot harder. So young people, when you get on your boards, uh, know that you have the support of your fellow members and uh, get to know them and you'll learn a lot as well and your contributions will certainly be valued. Now some other questions coming up here. Do you get paid for being on a board typically? Who would like to talk about that? It goes to the huge range of boards and the basis on which people participate. Would anyone like to comment? Um, yes, typically I do but by the same token, I um, always invest in the company at the same time. So it's kind of kind of nets out and uh, I feel board members should have a personal financial commitment in the company, it's, assuming it's a not-for-profit organisation, obviously. Um, so yes, so <clears throat> I will take stock and I'll take uh, uh, payment, but I'll also invest quite heavily in the company as well. It just, um, you know, there's nothing like um, when the company hurts, you hurt. And I think that's very important. Thank you, Andrew. I would say my board roles are about 50-50, half paid, half uh, volunteer. The only, um, and, and have no problem in volunteering if it's a cause that, that I believe in and that's important and where, you know, particularly if it's a, a charity. The area where I do push back is if I find, and, and I've found it on, on in a few instances, Coming from a consultancy background, um, it's, it can be assumed that someone else is paying for your time uh, when you're on a volunteer board. And I've been in the position where I've been the only person on the board that's been volunteering my time and everybody else's time is covered by another organization. And if that's the case, I do speak up and say and, and question that from a fairness perspective and, and it also becomes my choice as well. So sometimes people just aren't aware of, of your situation. Uh, they want your expertise, um, but they don't appreciate that that you're not getting compensated in any way for it. Thank you. That was a nuanced answer and hopefully very helpful. Uh, probably uh, it should be clarified that not-for-profit boards typically do not offer remuneration or even uh, reimbursement of expenses as Andrew and, and Leonie had indicated, and I think Stacey too, the expectation is that you are donating time and indeed the incidental expenses associated with your performance on the board. Now, a couple of other questions here. As a scientist, how can you best articulate what you bring to a board compared with those with a corporate background, like, you know, lawyer, management consultant? Who would uh, like that would to? be me, I guess, as the scientist. It's, it's <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it's interesting because um, from an ASX perspective, there are very few boards that advertise for scientists. Uh, and in which case, you know, I'm, I see myself as a commercially oriented scientist. I have an MBA. I've done the uh, AICD course. Um, you know, I've always been on the commercial end of science. And so when you look at the skills matrix of that board position, I try and align both my scientific problem solving, you know, uh, process management, strategic skills to that role um, and also my business skills as well. But, you know, it's fair to say that there aren't any of the boards that I sit on that use my 
um, the qualifications that I got through my academic degrees or through some of my earlier experience. It, it is more of those STEM type skills, as I mentioned about creative and um, problem solving, idea creation, strategic management, all of those interpersonal skills that become a value. But yeah, it is challenging being a scientist applying for ASX roles. Um, and as a scientist, I do enjoy advisory boards roles um, more so because they tend to be a bit more technical and you can continue to leverage the, the technical learning side of the role, which I really enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Leonie. Hopefully that's encouraging. Um, having had some earlier discussions uh, about scientists uh, on boards, I am very enthusiastic about the future role of scientists, not only in the community, in government, uh, in corporates, but on boards, because now is the time when technical knowledge is increasingly important, whether it's data science, climate change, the necessary implications of decisions with risk frameworks in mind. Scientists have the training which could really turbocharge the performance of a board. So I'm very encouraging of you scientists out there. <laughs> uh, a couple more questions from uh, our audience around diversity, uh, not only gender, but uh, backgrounds. Um, and uh, the, the question really says, uh, how do you ensure diversity on boards. Uh, the questioner says um, there's um, there are difficulties um, getting a board role, particularly women of colour who may face a, a double whammy. Things are changing, aren't they though? I think we're making progress. Uh, Stacey, would you like perhaps to comment? Yes, sure. Um, and thank you for the question. I um, feel very strongly about women of colour and diversity and in general. Um, so a couple of things. If you're already on a board and you want to ensure board diversity, I would suggest that the board develop a diversity and inclusion strategy and so that it's very explicitly considered um, and explicitly and collectively agreed to. Um, I think that is a really useful mechanism to have a very transparent and open conversation about diversity and inclusion. Um, if you're not on a board, and this is coming from the point of view of recruiting a board, and I was very, very deeply committed to recruiting um, a diverse Victorian government board and not having the usual suspects who serve on, you know, 10 other Victorian government boards um, be on this one. Um, use your networks as much as possible because that's what we use to recruit and so i'm um, i very much challenged our recruiter to look in diverse places for people that were not the usual people so use your linkedin network as much as possible so that we can find you um, when we are looking for people to recruit i think that's um really useful and we went through a, um, a large number of platforms and i can provide more information on those platforms to find a diverse group of, of people Thank you very much, Stacey. Uh, I'm mindful of time. We're getting very close uh, to concluding. I think uh, at least one more question we could share. Um, and uh, I'll take this one. Uh, if you could recount an anecdote of the most rewarding moment that comes to mind in your capacity as a board member an experience where you influenced uh, an outcome, would someone like to offer an experience like that. A significant memorable achievement as a board member. I think we all have one or two. <laughs> yeah, just just wondering whether whether it's appropriate to share it. Um, I guess the this is a very practical and detailed one, but the company I was on the board wanted to um, borrow funds to pay a dividend. And whilst that's appropriate for large organisations like BHP, I guess, but it's not so for a small cap company. So um, I lobbied quite hard because I was the only board member that was opposing it. Uh, because again, this, this is where this conflict between acting in the interests of the shareholders versus board members um, really came to play. And then that one, and I managed to win that one, but that was that was probably the most substantial thing that I think I've done on a board in a long time. An important one too. Now I'm uh, 
mindful that we have one last poll to share with you today. So I'd like to invite you to participate in it, provide your feedback. Now, this one is a really almost uh, economic uh, and uh, trying to get a bit of a, a sense check on how the economy looks from your particular organization's perspective. It's a broader question. So we ask you, which of the following best describes your intention towards hiring staff in your current role? And uh, that's over the next three months or so, just to give us a little snapshot in, into how the economy is playing out uh, in your parts of uh, the world. And in the meantime, uh, I have uh, just a moment to mention a couple of things to you, and that is through our questions, we've had numbers uh, of people seeking more information about AICD courses, about women on boards as an organization, about community uh, governance organizations. I think that what we might try and do uh, through VESCI is to gather some of these links and share them with uh, registrants would be useful. And if you have questions that you would like the panel to respond to, but we have run out of time today to do so, please send those questions through, uh, through to Vesky, and I'm sure the panel would join me in being very happy to provide some feedback as we're very encouraging of you in your journeys. So let's have a look at uh, how that uh, poll went. And unsurprisingly, in this very uncertain post-COVID world, uh, no immediate plans for many people uh, to hire. Also, uh, seasonally, uh, fewer people nor or fewer companies hire over the summer break. So that's perhaps taken with the COVID situation, uh, not surprising. So I think it, uh, it um, falls to me now uh, to thank uh, each of uh, my fellow panelists thank them for sharing some of their journey, uh, their insights. And as a takeaway, uh, I would encourage everyone to think about board roles as a future option, if you feel that it's attractive to you, to think about how do you connect with people who are doing things in areas of interest to you? Or which organizations, as Andrew said, are you attracted to? Where could you make a contribution look to connect with those people. Networking really is as simple as tapping someone on the shoulder that you know already and have a chat with them about your interests in participating in an organization. And for most of us, uh, we, we did that at one stage in our career and that was to put our hand up and say, look, I'm very interested in this particular sector or organization. Um, how can I get closer to it? Could I volunteer on a committee, a working party, on a project? Uh, and uh, having done that many, many times in different places uh, myself, what that does is it gives you an opportunity to demonstrate your skills and your enthusiasm. Uh, and that is very quickly recognized. And funnily enough, uh, you might well find doors open as a result. But I certainly encourage you to pursue networking, pursue your professional development, and uh, I'm hopeful that Besky will be able to give you some links to encourage you to look further afield in your professional development. So with that, thank you very much to Dr. Leonie Walsh, to Stacey Ong, and to Andrew Pippolo for joining me on this panel this afternoon. Uh, I think I will now uh, hand back to Julia Page to conclude today's panel. Thank you so very much, Genevieve. What a fantastic treat for us all this afternoon. I think we could have continued on for almost another hour with the number of questions that were coming through. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been tasked with delivering some concluding remarks and a vote of thanks to today's contributors. May I firstly say it's an absolute honour to do so in my capacity as a founding member of the Vesky Inspiring Women STEM Side by Side programme. And as you heard from Leela at the commencement of the webinar, the program now in its third iteration has been uniquely tailored this year for 34 competitively selected mid-career emerging leaders. 
Whilst the programme not always follows that traditional leadership pathways, its essence is to bring together women across STEM industries, striving for their first senior leadership role, to network and build lifelong collegiate relationships with like-minded colleagues across disciplines and sectors. Ordinarily, today's partnership with Michael Page would also have afforded us a unique networking opportunity with potential collaborators, future employees, and those looking to appoint board directors. Despite not being able to gather face-to-face, -face, hopefully you have garnered some insights and tips from our experienced panel on how to pursue your first board appointment. We heard about the importance of networking, coffee catch-ups, volunteering roles where you might undertake a project or belong to a working group or even a public officer or secretary. We also heard about the skills and attributes that will help you um, along the way and for those of you already on your board journey a few strategies of how to grow your current board portfolio. And should you currently sit on a board that is acutely aware of its and its of its lack of diversity and inclusion, feel free to reach out to us. We have over 90 talented individuals eager for the opportunity to contribute to an equitable society in either a senior leadership role or at the boardroom table. To our moderator Genevieve Overall and to our panelists Stacey Ong. Andrew Pippolo and Leonie Walsh, may I extend my heartfelt thanks. Your passion and willingness today to share your experiences has made for a most stimulating and fruitful discussion. So my thanks. I'm also grateful to our program supporters and session facilitators who've helped us adapt to delivering the Vesky Inspiring Women STEM side-by-side -side program virtually this year. I would like especially to acknowledge and thank um, Michael Page for their ongoing support and particularly to David George, Leela Lewis and John Summerhays and his team for partnering, us, partnering with us to bring you today's event. Ladies and gentlemen, I do hope that you enjoyed today's webinar on board pathways and insights. Thank you for joining us and in the words of Andrew Pippolo, go hound them down. Have a great day and thank you very much indeed.